welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for making it out when the campus is a puddle and the city is a puddle. Um, we're really glad to see you here and welcome also to the people who are joining the live stream, which may be a bigger number than usual given the weather. Um, really excited to be here to talk about David Bates' new book, which is not yet out, but coming out April 4th, uh, An Artificial History of Natural Intelligence. We have um, at the door some flyers where I believe you can get, is there a discount or is it just, yes, 30% off discount. So um, if we don't resolve all of your questions about this book, which we could not possibly do, go out and, and buy it. Um, so we are here at the Maison Française. I am a professor of French literature and to some extent philosophy in the French department here at Columbia. So this David's book is not especially about French things, but I do want to start with a micro French lesson slash anecdote about the brain and artificial intelligence. So of course, I was struggling to read quickly enough this wonderful book, which is nearly 400 pages um, and ranges extremely broadly, as you will hear in our discussion. And I texted a friend of mine to say, I'm reading this book about the brain and artificial intelligence, and I'm not going to be done in time for the event. And she texted me back, Chat GPT can surely help. So for those of you who know French, <laughs> you know that Chat GPT, the way she wrote it, meant means cat, I farted. <laughs> but if you were to write it a different way, it would mean chat GPT. So I looked at this message, and I had no idea what she meant. And I thought to myself, what's up must have done some sort of automatic, you know, autocorrect, what can she possibly mean? It took me I'm slower than obviously all of you. But um, it took me a little while to figure out that she meant I should read David's book with chat GPT. I did not do that. Reduce it a few pages. <laughs> <laughs> I did not want to do that. But it struck me that this uh, happening was kind of illustrative of some of the things that David writes about in the book, which is the fact that the creativity uh, that the human brain is capable of in calling chat GPT, chat GPT, or cat I farted, is one of the, the things that David is interested in this book, in addition to the automaticity of the, the brain and its machine-like functioning and sort of how those two things work together. We are at the Maison Française. I want to thank uh, Shani Pierre and, and Fanny Gay, who are, maybe Shani is here, in the back for um, supporting this event, helping to organize it, um, welcoming us here at the Maison Française. Really glad to see some of my undergraduates here. Um, we welcome undergrads at the Maison Française. We have lots of events, film series, etc. So please come back again. Mm -hmm. The event is also co-sponsored by the Society of Fellows and the Heyman Center for the Humanities here at Columbia and by the Consortium for Intellectual and Cultural History at NYU. I think I might have Stefanos to thank uh, for that. So thank you. Um, we are, I'm going to keep the bios very brief um, so that we have plenty of time to discuss this book, which, which touches on so many different things that it's going to be hard to talk about all of it in, and we probably won't try to do that in 45 minutes, but we want to leave plenty of time for your questions, so we'll be sure to keep an eye on the time. Um, so I'm going to introduce first my interlocutor, uh, Stefanos Yaranulos. I'm most happy that he's here because, like I said, I do 18th century French literature. I really can't talk about a lot of the things in this book. Stefanos is someone who can talk about pretty much everything that this book covers, right? Um, and uh, is a regular here at the Maison Française. He's the director of the Remark Institute and professor of European intellectual history at NYU. And he and David seem to be in some sort of interesting intellectual symbiosis because they both have new books coming out two days apart. Um, and uh, Stefanos' new book, his latest, uh, he is prolific, and I'm not going to talk about his other books because we wouldn't have time to do that, is The Invention of Prehistory, Empire Violence, and Our Obsession with Human Origins, coming out two days after David's book. So I'm sure he's doing a lot of podcasts, so check that those out, and probably also events that you can attend. David Bates is a professor of rhetoric at Berkeley, where he also served as director of the Center for New Media. And I'll just mention two of his publications, even though I'm trying to keep uh, the bios brief, because they're relevant, in my mind at least, to our discussion tonight. His first book, Enlightenment Aberrations, Error and Revolution in France, 
was on the epistemological and political significance of error in 18th century Enlightenment thought and how it played out in the French Revolution, especially the terror. And the question of error is going to be very important in, in this book in terms of artificial intelligence and the functioning of the brain, sort of self-interruption, interruption, interruption that, that can be productive in technological advances and in thinking. More recently, David published States of War, Enlightenment Origins of the Political, which has a key chapter that I really love called Rousseau's Cybernetic Political Body. And in that chapter, you can see David sort of thinking, he's been thinking about the issues that are in this new book for a really long time. And some of those issues come uh, out in his interpretation of Rousseau's sort of artificial political body. Rousseau is not in the new book, but I suspect he might be a kind of shadow figure. And so I might ask him to talk about that later if he's, if he's willing. On a personal note, I just want to say, I said I was going to keep the bios brief, and I'm not, but uh, I want to say that I first met David in April uh, 2001. Um, I had to go back and reconstruct the, the prehistory. The internet couldn't really help me with that. I was writing my dissertation, and David was uh, an assistant professor, I believe, at Berkeley at the time. We were on a conference panel together, and he was speaking about Condillac. I was speaking about Buffon. Um, this was one of the first times in my academic career when I felt that I had met a kindred spirit and someone who made me feel like what I was doing made sense, both on a personal level for me and also the kinds of issues that I was pursuing in the work that I didn't really know would turn into a career at the time because I had a lot of doubts about writing a dissertation. Um, David has moved far afield from the Enlightenment since that time while also really staying grounded in it in some way, um, especially in this latest book, but I'm still hanging on, reading everything he writes and trying to engage with it. And uh, his scholarship has been a real inspiration to me. So now it's going to be a conversation. I'm not going to talk that much anymore. Um, David, I want to start with your title. <laughs> Let's start. Get ready. <laughs> Can I say thank you first? <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> thanks to both of you for, for doing this. And thanks to everyone for coming out. It's a terrible night, but I really appreciate the, the audience. Very, very humbling. Um, so an artificial history of natural intelligence. What I love about this title is that it trips up the brain. I, every time I tried to tell somebody what this book was called, I wanted to say automatically a natural history of artificial intelligence. And so the title is kind of performing a little brain experiment on us, um, which is it shows us the automaticity of the brain. And at the same time, it performs that kind of self-interruption. At least that's, that's my little mini literary reading of the title. The title's also complicated because you tell us that your book is not a history of anything, I quote, and there is no natural intelligence, I quote. So <laughs> what is an artificial history? Um, and how can you write about a, a, an artificial history of natural intelligence if there is no natural intelligence? That's a really good question. I'll start, I'll defer by starting with Francis Bacon, who, whose um, ep epigraphs are the opening of the book. And he said that that natural history can consist of nature and its freedom, nature and its sort of pathologies or monsters, or nature constrained. And nature constrained is essentially when humans organize nature into artificial things. And then he also says that the human mind requires or takes advantage of prosthetic supplements, instruments, in order to see and understand the world better. So, so what I'm thinking about with the title is to say, um, looking at the, 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 the bacon, is that the artificial history is essentially the history of those, those categories of what has to be constructed by the human. And what I want to, to, to pull out in, in the book as a kind of thread that goes from right from the beginning with Descartes up until the present is that there is no such thing as the human that does this work of creating technology, that, that the human mind is from the very beginning um, constructed through its use of external implements. So there can never not be a natural history of natural intelligence because natural intelligence never actually exists. Do we need to be a little bit? No, uh, so you can have one. Okay, thanks. Very nice of you. Yeah, uh, you. <laughs> and and so that's that's exactly where where I want to kind of put pressure on the notion of natural intelligence is that what we mean by natural intelligence or the intelligence that's intrinsic to the human is something that can't be understood without thinking about the the history and the theory of technology. Um, but I also didn't want it to be a natural history of artificial intelligence because that assumes too much the independence of artificial technologies like ChatGPT, generative AI, many other programs of research. 
And so I wanted to also put pressure on the idea that what we call artificial intelligence is always already a kind of part of, of a human, social, political, technical system. And I don't draw out all the implications of that in this book. It's some of the work I'm doing right now, actually, on the political. But, but I did want to, as you say, disentangle and, and, and sort of um, dismember those concepts of natural history. And, and that's what I use this term, artificial history, to, to imply that kind of dismemberment. So it's a history of nothing in that it's not a history of artificial intelligence. I used to call it a deep history of AI, but it's not really a history of artificial intelligence. And there can be no history of natural intelligence. So it's really what I, what I would say is following a trajectory, an entanglement of minds and machines and concepts of the body in particular that try to make sense of this, this lack, which is the human mind that requires these prosthetics in order to, to do intelligent work. You want to follow up? Okay. Okay. Jump in. Yeah. So I'm I'm much more. I'm going to sort of um, handle the early stuff that I'm a little bit more in a position to handle, and then turn things over to Stefanos. Um, let's talk a little bit about automaticity, which mm -hmm. is um, and autonomy. So you insist on the fact that you want to avoid platitudes about the human. This is not a sort of naive humanism in response to the crisis, as it were, posed by AI. And the book places a lot of emphasis on what I loved this uh, quotation one cognitive science paper calls the unbearable automaticity of being. Um, for the literary among you, you will appreciate that as well. But you're also deeply interested in human autonomy, even if you also don't want naive definitions of human autonomy. And um, so how do we recuperate what we call autonomy or new forms of autonomy by rethinking the automatic, the machine-like? Yeah, that's a really good, that's a hard question because that's something that, that goes through the whole book and I'm yeah. trying to work out. I think the first point I just wanted to emphasize what you said, which is that not everyone, I mean, with thinking about AI, you can definitely see how concepts of intelligence are, are, are being automatized and, and that the idea is that AI will tell us something about ourselves. But I think there's this longer history that goes back to the early days of AI and it's kind of twinned history with cognitive sciences that, that essentially used the computer as a model for the brain and using the, the, the idea of artificial intelligence as a kind of way of thinking about the mind. So it, it might not be as well known um, as it should that modern cognitive neuroscience essentially thinks of autonomy as a kind of wishful thinking or, or a non-scientific um, topic. So when we, when we confront that with, with our humanistic kind of um, training, we want to resist. But again, the, often the resistance, as you said, is a kind of romantic one, which is, of course, humans are free. They have creativity, they have the capacity for novelty. You just list attributes, but it's not very scientific according to the cognitive scientists. Um, so what I wanna do with this work is, is to kind of look historically at this idea of automaticity to try and tease out a way of thinking about autonomy that does not so much counter auto automatic processes per se, but work within them. And that's really where I want to take a deeper look in the long history of thinking about the brain and the mind and what we might call intelligent machinery to see how those machines are capable of creativity, novelty, these attributes that we often attribute to a kind of human essence that are actually perhaps possible or at least thinkable within the realm of automaticity so that we don't have to reject the, the general sort of thinking around cognitive science, which is that the brain is somehow related to thinking. It's obviously that we can't really reject that, that, that premise. Um, what that actually means in practice is played out in different registers in the book itself. So I could talk about those, but I, I don't want to go too, too much on. I mean, if you want to, but we can, I think they will come back in, exactly. in particular, at particular moments. I mean, I think you do a really good job of, you know, for a reader like me, I'm constantly thinking, oh, he believes in creativity. Oh, he believes that, that we're still human. But, you know, you do a good job of not sort of allowing it to be the naive way of, of thinking about those. Um, so the book, for those of you, I mean, all of you, because it's not out yet, I haven't read it yet, except for the, the two of us who are lucky enough to have this advanced 
preview is divided into four parts. It actually has a very uh, innovative form, I would say. So it starts with a frame, um, a sort of introduction of sorts or preface. The part, part one is called The Automatic Life of Reason in Early Modern Thought. So it goes from Descartes, who's the originary figure, up to Kant, who is framed as a threshold figure. And the, the figure of the threshold is important to David theoretically, coming from Stiegler, I think. Right. Um, so the fact that that Kant is a sort of threshold figure is important. And then I'll tell you a little bit more about the form of the book. But let's start with that early modern um, section. I don't want to belabor it just because that's what I'm interested in. And that's sort of also where David started a lot of his his work. But I want to ask you, why does it all start with Descartes? Um, and maybe you could talk about what you mean by Cartesian robotics and at the same time, uh, the sort of plasticity, openness, plasticity, as you put it, creativity and indetermination that that can still be combined with this Cartesian robotics. Yeah, again, a very good question, a very, a very difficult one. I think you have to start with Descartes. I mean, there's ways that we could probably locate other figures who are doing work in different areas that Descartes is, is, is thinking. But you start with Descartes because with the rise of the scientific revolution and mechanical philosophy, it was really the first time that we would have a rigorous, um, rigorous conceptualization of the body, in particular the living body, as a machine. So we could have previous sort of mechanical concepts, but this was now tied to a fundamental ontology of the scientific revolution, that everything is matter in motion, and that to understand anything, however complicated, it needs to be, it needs to be um, tracked as a series of causal relationships. So Descartes is, I think, one of the best for thinking that through to the limit in his early work on the treatise on man or in the discourse on method um, and later in passions of the soul he's he's constantly talking about the body um, but what's interesting about descartes work is that he doesn't just talk about the the kind of mechanical aspects of the body the stomach the digestion the movement and so on which we wouldn't expect to be something more than mechanical he also talks about the 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 the, the fact of thinking itself or at least what we might call cognition and there he gets extremely interesting because he he looks at the nervous system in a way that I think has not really much precedent. He thinks of the nervous system as a kind of information processing machine. In other words, not so much a series of gears or clockwork mechanisms or hydraulic mechanisms or what have you, but actually um, an information machine that takes sensory information, codes it, decodes it, and sends it to the brain where it gets put together into a picture of the world, essentially. So, so Descartes is like taking the mechanical philosophy to its limit to describe how animals and even humans have a certain kind of cognitive capacity for reacting and, and, and modeling their environment, which is a very modern cognitive science sort of perspective. But in his philosophy, he pushes to the limit this idea that, that, that the body could not explain certain experiences that he himself has in his own thinking. And that's where we get to the famous, I think, therefore I am of the, the second meditation, um, where Descartes really is trying to demonstrate to the reader that everything that comes into the mind can be traced to the senses, in other words, to the corporeal cognitive machinery of the body, except this quality of what he calls intuition or intellect. And he tries to demonstrate that in his text. And so, so what I think of um, what's important about Descartes' work is both the extreme interest in the mechanization and sort of the this almost cybernetic way that he talks about the body as a reactive information machine, but also pushing to the limit a human experience that seems to be incapable of mechanization or even understood as an information process. And so what I what I want to argue in the book is that even though he never resolves the tension between those two, we can't ignore the first part of Descartes, the Cartesian robotic side, which is to say, we must put into play any of these concepts of human thinking into the economy of the body and especially the nervous system, because after Descartes, that's going to become more and more important in the history of thinking about physiology. So, so that's where Descartes sort of I would say over the course of his career, especially looking to the late text, The Passions of the Soul, that, that he more and more thinks of the quality of mind as subservient to the body. And that, that ultimately what I argue in the book is that the mind and its intellect is, is a capacity for interruption. 
By that, I mean the intellect is something that, that interrupts the economy of normal cognition, which is sensory-based, based in the imagination, memory, and so on. And that the intellect is that possibility of interrupting that machine, especially for, for facing challenging and exceptional circumstances. So that's one of the themes that I, that I take through the book is thinking about after Descartes, is it possible to think about that possibility of interruption, a kind of autonomy within the automatic processes of the body, um, but within the body itself or within the machine itself? And that's what, what's important for the book is that for Descartes, the machine and the body are already closely um, interrelated and implicated in one another. So that as the book goes forward, new physiologies, new concepts of the brain have to be put into play with new machines. And that's why I think I don't really track a history of something. It's more this constant sort of dialogue between the two. Yeah, there's a kind of cycling back of, of certain kinds of yeah certain ideas come back into play as well as Descartes for example will become more relevant in later periods than you might expect right. that's absolutely a, that's a very interesting aspect of it so um maybe just Kant so I have to give a, a small plug since there are some of my my undergrads who were in my core uh curriculum course uh at Columbia literature humanities um thank you for being here uh the second year of that course is Contemporary Civilization and features some of your authors. Descartes is on it, Hobbes is on it, Kant is on it. So you have, uh, to the extent that there are undergraduates among us, you have a very good audience for some of this material. Kant is hard, notoriously. I found the, the book is extremely limpid. Um, I found the Kant chapters difficult, so I'm not going to ask you to explain them, especially since you keep saying- I was saying... trying to reread them today, and I find them hard, too. So. Yeah, sorry about that. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to ask you about Kant, David. Um, Kant is interested in the human hand. How about we just talk, could we just talk about that, possibly? Why is he interested in the human hand? Well, that's sort of the end of my argument, is to kind of come with this figure that 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 Kant gives us of the hand where he says that that everything that's important about human thinking and intelligence is already figured in the hand. And this is something that Stephanos and I talk a lot about in, in other contexts, which is the liberation of the hand as a kind of figure for human autonomy. The idea is that the hand has no one task, like for Kant, the hand is perfectly organized for multiple tasks, and it literally doesn't just um, you know, it doesn't just push things or, or whatever, it actually holds them and manipulates, which again comes from the word hand, and is capable of organizing. So the hand is this, like, like for me in, in this particular context, the, the opening up of something like the origin of technology, that the hand is capable of organizing what is unorganized. And that, that's through the figure of, the, of this, this, this instrument that can be capable of and essentially anything, it's open and, and has no one task. So this will come, out, come back later with um, thinkers like Andre Leroy Goran and Stigler later in the text. But that sort of comes at the end of a long reading of Kant over two chapters. So I'm not sure how to, how to relate <laughs> how to get that, there. <laughs> how to get there. But what I wanted to do in the two chapters in Kant is first chapters on the first critique and the, the second chapters on the third critique is to kind of work with like Adorno famously said uh, in his book on Kant's first critique that you could think of the mind for Kant as a kind of machine in which you throw in a bunch of experience and the machine sort of processes it and what comes out is your thinking at the end. And to a certain degree, that's kind of right. So what I really wanted to sort of push in the reading of the first critique is how intricate that machine is and how it's constantly failing in some ways and always having to sort of keep up with itself which is to say trying to maintain its own unity and its own coherence. And that's the function of reason in, in the text. Um, and then with the third critique, I take that, that concept of unity and organization and reading through his, his comments on the teleological judgment and, and the organism, try to say that, that despite himself, he has a theory of the organism, which is also potentially al always failing. His comments on pathology show that he knows that animals in particular will be subject to, to injury or to damage and that they're capable of overcoming that. So I try to make a parallel there between the sort of organism of the, the machinery that is the mind, that it has an organismic quality, not a mere mechanical quality, 
and pair that with the thinking about organism and link them through this idea of what I would call the spontaneity of self-repair. And, and that means that the judgment can be anal an analogized with the, this capacity of an organism to, to repair itself. And both of those things are in some ways inexplicable for Kant. They're a way that the unity of the mind or the unity of the organism appears concretely, but in a way that is in some ways um, entirely ephemeral. So that, that mystery of pathology and unity and organization, I, I try to trace through the early modern, but also it becomes really important later in the book. And is that the sense, so you call him a threshold figure sort of opening out yeah. onto a modern neuroscientific worldview? Exactly. Yeah. And also thinking seriously about the mind as not reducible to the organismic, but that it has to be thought through certain kinds of new ideas that are coming from biology rather than strictly the sort of old mechanism that 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 harbored, you know, certain possibilities in the 17th and 18th century, but that mm -hmm. for him were were kind of closed roads. Great. So I'm going to reserve my question about why Rousseau is not in the book uh, for if if unless I missed him um, for later. Stefano. Did I not even mention this? In the book? It's possible. I mean, it's not that you don't mention him, but I. A lot of the thinking about the 18th century began with Rousseau, but I felt like I'd written about Rousseau already no. with similar kinds of ideas in play, and I just felt like it wasn't necessary, but yeah. I'm willing to hear otherwise. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, part of what I do with the Romantic Institute involves posting, and so you have to sort of introduce in a slightly different mode than you would and the position where I'm in. So I decided that I actually wanted to take a minute and read out some proper praise of the book, uh, which I don't normally get to do. I get, it's a completely different task. And as David didn't do an overview, I thought that might actually be a little relevant. So um, from my perspective, it's not often that we read such a major work. Um, the idea of covering modern philosophy, not to mention half a dozen other disciplines in relation to it, since Descartes and all the way to the present and talking about technology sounds like a recipe for disaster. Um, in fact, this is exactly the opposite. And to be very clear about an artificial history of natural intelligence, um, as a study in technological and political thought since Descartes, this is by far the most ambitious, original, and significant study you will read this year, perhaps in quite some more time than that. It, I consider it a tremendous achievement and that I really believe it um, deserves a broad audience. Kant on the hand um, aside. <laughs> so to those of us who know of David's states of war and especially um, his essays, uh, particularly the political physiology essay, the catacomb for the cybernetic age, the catastrophe in human order, um, this is no surprise that technology and decision are his key um, terrain. Um, here, still, those essays have nothing like the reach that uh, this book this book can can have. It is a pleasure to read, and just I'll keep repeating, it really is a triumph. Now, he argues that conceptions of intelligence, humanity, and selfhood since Descartes have been threaded through and through and consistently mediated by technicity, artificiality, industry, and technology. Um, as you've heard him say already, there's never been a natural intelligence to be contrasted with artificial intelligence. And on the contrary, we encounter here a history of humanity, which exudes tools, but also exudes the concepts through which we can understand these tools, these machines. Um, and as a result, a, con a, a vision of humanity that basically constructs itself through these machines, concepts, and so on, systems as they go. And so particularly in the last third of the book, it becomes quite clear how emphatically technology and the human are interwoven in, let's say, not this history of uh, modern thought or technological thought, but, but in this consistent self-engagement uh, of modern thought with technology. And at the same time, quite how much conceptions of error, of errancy, of catastrophe, of disruption, rely on this uh, human and technology duet, on this dancing duet. Uh, quite how much decision needs to be conceived of at the same time in uh, what David refers to as anthropotechnic terms. So in a way, the conceptualization of the human and of the mind has relied through and through on technological theorizations 
and simulations, uh, something that's worked at times for ideas of human autonomy and sometimes works for the articulation of the political domain or for the undoing of a certain kind of um, easy autonomy. So how does he do this? Um, just as you've seen David do here, uh, what he does is he prioritizes or he puts his finger on uh, his subject's account of artifice or of machinery or of technology. And um, then he begins to see what happens to the rest of their thinking as a result of that, putting the finger on, on, on the tech question. Um, and so the, this ends up being at once a kind of historical work and a deconstructive work, uh, in large part because he continues to be interested in the unity of the system of thought while being, uh, you know, let's say, uh, seduced into a system of thought by way of the technology or of the techno technology, you know, the thinking of, of techni, if you will. Um, so as he writes repeatedly, this isn't exactly a history of artificial intelligence, and it's not a straightforward promise or a full-fledged critique of the realm and, and force of modern technology. Uh, it's an attempt to take seriously problems of crisis, the will, decision, as these are affected both by the long and the short history of automation and artificial intelligence. And so um, David brings in a fair amount of Carl Schmidt, particularly toward the, the end of the book, and as is his um, habit. Um, and uh, at the same time, he negotiates this uh, against thinking, especially reliant on uh, Stiegler, Bernard Stiegler, and other attendant thinkers, uh, André Leroy Gouron, Gilles Deleuze, and Catherine Malabou. Um, we find ourselves, in other words, um, trying to think both of this kind of productive um, of these productive engagements with technology in which technology is a kind of constantly generated uh, rather than simply what is distinguished from thought or science or nature. Um, and at the same time, uh, we get to see it negotiating questions of decision, especially um, as these go. So as Joanna said before, uh, this is a book that's really done with the humanist hubris and the shibboleths of like, we're better than machines, this is what we are versus this is what machines are. Um, but it painstakingly reconstructs the, this, this long engagement of what it means to be relating oneself to machine, uh, what it means to be theorizing the self, the mind, and so on by, by way of the machine. So um, I, um, you can see why I thought this deserved a little bit of a written uh, text. It's not so easy to be pulled into, nor to to um, you know negotiate this world that goes from automata to proto computers to you know uh, well computers and now to to AI. Um, but the argument of the book is basically to play this out in in detail and time and time again. I wanted to point out that there's a couple of extra part uh, aspects of this that are really um, key. One is that um, the way that we're describing it, it's as though the individual chapters are, are, you know, the heart of it. But I tend to think that there's something that happens between chapters. So first off, this is probably the, you know, I mean, correct me, but I think this is one of the very few books that have a chapter on Heidegger and a chapter on Wittgenstein intended to to you know, speak diagonally toward one another. Um, and and these are, let's say, the least important at one level. Then there's all the chapters on Gestalt theory, on cybernetics, uh, elaborate chapters on uh, thermodynamics, Helmholtz, Marx, and, and so on, leading all the, the way to the present. Uh, what's amazing about them is that they're short. So you sort of, by the time that you finish one, you can think already what it related to and what was happening before and how it moves forward. So you don't actually really need to know everything about everybody. You will end up wondering how he does know all of that. <laughs> I really do um, wonder. And so, um, but at the same time, you can see how the problem kind of commands the direction and the uh, discussion of the, the text. So I'll just shut up now and uh, I'll get to questions. Um, but I really wanted to be explicit because you get to decide um, you know, whether it's worth the cost, not in dollars, but in illusions, um, that it would- 30% off. Really, it's not, but no 30% off on illusions. This is like, um, 
you know, that's something you're going to have to, to, to work with. So, um, David, I really wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about this sort of the shift in concept akin to intelligence and concepts that aren't exactly that. But in particular, I thought at some length in reading you again now about the will and about decision. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to see how you would track quickly for us the changes that you see in thinking about the will and decision mm -hmm. that as these happen by way of technological um, conceptualizations of um, well, intelligence, will, decision, the mind, uh, and so on and so forth. And so this is important because then I want to also secondarily ask you how we go from decision back toward tech uh, or toward technological conceptions of the self and its impact. Yeah, again, these are really great questions, really hard ones, because they get to the heart of the whole book. But thanks again for, for your overview. That was really, really nice. Thank you. Um, if I went backwards and, and started with AI, I feel like what we really have to, to kind of recognize with contemporary artificial intelligence, but, but if I had more time to explain how artificial intelligence, especially deep learning, is, is, has massively influenced the way we already think about the brain mm -hmm. and the self and, and thinking in, of intelligence um, in particular, that there is no room for what I would call decision. There is no room for what I would call genuine anticipation genuine imagination, genuine novelty, that it, that it really has erased all of those categories by its very ontology. So that's where I open the book, is this sort of what, what we might call a crisis of decision, is that we can't even decide about what technology should or shouldn't be in our culture, given that our minds are literally being trained by AIs and by technical systems to be less and less capable of decision. So then the question is, again, not, not a matter of going back to saying human beings are free and have will, and this is just something to kind of recuperate from a natural being. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually a very difficult problem that has no clear answer when we think about how closely technology has, has shaped the way that we, that we think about the mind, but also literally has shaped the mind itself in its technical um, being. Mm -hmm. So if I had to chart it out sort of briefly, I would say, what we have with the early modern period, especially you know, with Descartes and with Spinoza and Leibniz and even Hume to a certain degree, which opens the book, is, is the idea that there is something about the human as a physiological creature that gives us insight into kind of the higher order of meaning in the universe. Mm -hmm. And that's a very early modern gesture. Um, but what it does for me is to, to actually place that possibility of exceptionality within physiological concepts that are so mediated by technical concepts. Mm -hmm. So, but, but the early modern, it's definitely to think of the, 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 the decisive moment or the creative moment as an exception to the mechanical. But meanwhile, we have this new orga or, organismic kind of view that, that is also helping to kind of complicate that. So the threshold is Kant because Kant's spontaneity and, and his theory of judgment is not simply that. It's not, a, it's not a kind of channeling or instantiation of some cosmic order, but something quite different. It's from within the system of thought, something happens. So it's like the, 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 the brain, the mind as a unity is capable of altering itself from within. So what I argue in the sections on the 19th century is that we can look at the history of brain science, the history of thermodynamics, Babbage and others, as trying to articulate in mechanical terms what might be something like an exception or a moment of openness, a moment of decision. And that fluctuates depending on who we're talking about. It's either more mechanical, more deterministic, or there's more interest in, like in brain science, as you know, in thinking about plasticity, about openness, about the way that the brain is capable of taking on new forms. So rather than thinking of it as a will to exempt yourself from the physiology of the body, it's from within physiology, there's the capacity for novelty, for openness. So the next part of the book says essentially what happens when machines start to be constructed that have some of the characteristics of this physiological quality of openness, of exception, of self-determination in a certain kind of way, but from within the system. And that would be the chapters on the computer and the cybernetics. So that cybernetics, if you haven't you know, looked at cybernetics um, yourself or, or haven't heard the term, 
they were conceiving and making machines that were adaptive. Through feedback, these machines could react to the environment and seem to exhibit a certain kind of openness, a certain kind of ability to, to make decisions about, about their goals. Mm -hmm. Now, I critique cybernetics because ultimately I think they, they fail, but it's interesting to read them from this perspective because you get just how, how difficult the challenge was. How does a system that's even auto-regulative and adaptive and plastic, how does that system ever enter into a state that would be a real state of what I would call exception? Something that literally is not defined by the system itself, but happens within the system. And that's where I would turn to more of the philosophical writers to give a sense of where that idea comes from. Heidegger would be one of the most important. But the last part of the book is to try and say this question actually is in the history of artificial intelligence and cognitive science. It's just occluded and excised, but it's there. And, and what I want to do at the end with, with thinking about thinkers like uh, uh, my colleague Terence Deacon at Berkeley or with Bernard Stigler in particular, is that by thinking more deeply about our relationship to technology, that idea of how the brain is capable of novelty, of exception, of decision is linked with our technical capacities, not erased by them. And that is kind of a difficult part of the book, I would say, making that argument. But, but the, the quick story is that humans are, by definition, as they become human in the long history of millions of years ago, uh, partly because of the hands, this is one of the things that's interesting in this, in this story, uh, have a fundamental lack. They, they don't produce their own existence. As Marx says, humans had to produce their own form of existence, which is to say they had to technically, artificially make themselves capable of survival. And so someone like Stigler is really taking philosophically that point as the opening to define what it means to be a human. To be a human is to make te technologies as prosthetics for our lack of, of an essential being that can survive in nature. And what he tries to do in his work is to show that by using technology, the brain literally evolves in a new way and is always structured by our technical capacity. Now that might seem like deterministic and me mechanical, but in fact, it's the interplay between the living brain that is plastic, open, subject to failure, but also openness. It's the confrontation between the brain and what we might call the artificial organizations of technology that produce completely unexpected results because they're two different systems, the living and the dead, you might say. And both of those systems are essential for humanness, but they're also not reducible to one another. And that's why I think for, for me, the critique of AI at the end of the book is to say, there's no way that we'll model human minds by continually trying to model singular brains with singular capacities, no matter how complicated. We have to think about how the brain is immediately not only technical, but also social. And that these systems never, they're, they're never congruent with one another and could never then be reduced to the physiological instantiation in, inside our head. So that was a kind of a complicated answer to your question, but it's it's an easy one. Yeah. Can you say a little bit more about the, you know, as you put it, I want to prepare the way for a cri for the crisis of decision in this book, and I, I want to understand the terms as these go. We can leave prepare and way out of the way. But I'm curious about those, <laughs> those are the ones I was first thinking about. Okay, but they, but the, those two, but the, but say a little bit more about them. Well, I I think to to kind of to go a little bit more radical in what I do in the book, but which is part of the, the, the research that I'm doing now, coming out of Bernard Stigler's um, philosophy of, of technology is, is to say, it's not simply that technologies are becoming more automatic and that humans have to deal with more and more automatic machines. It's that because humans are defined in their essence and especially in their intelligence as, as partners with their technical implements to the point that technical implements shape the way that we think. And the big examples there would be the invention of writing, for example. With writing, you have a technology that, that reshapes the brain. And Stigler was always fond of citing these theorists like Marianne Wolf and others who show through, through um, brain imaging that to learn how to read is an artificial technology. And it requires the brain sort of bootstrapping different parts in order to create this, this possibility of what we call reading, reading and writing. Um, so when we move into the digital era, which is a threshold to a whole new epoch, the, the digital era 
it's not simply that we have automatic machines that we have to be careful about or that they might take over human capacities. It's that those machines are training us through their logic to become more and more um, participants in a logic of automatization. Which is the part that pushes out the decision tree. Exactly. Which pushes it out of the way. So, so we live not only with automatic machines and AI, but we live within a digital infrastructure that translates all of the different dimensions of our life from the most you know, intimate and personal to the financial to the political. And, and as you see with our phones and with our other devices, um, as Stigler warned us, we, we are training ourselves to be reactive to the technology and to a logic of technology that's fueled mostly by a capitalist logic. And, and that to me really is a crisis of decision because crisis means actually we need to make a decision because something's going wrong. So what we have in the contemporary era is a very difficult problem, which is the decision about technology is being, is being um, um, a, a threatened, not just by the fact of AI and the, the infiltration of digital technologies, but by the diminishment of the possibility or the capacity for decision. Now, decision, again, is a kind of complex topic, but for me, decision is only capable of, of appearing when automaticity stops. If it's not a decision, unless we actually have something new that happens, otherwise it's simply a continuation of the, the system. You don't feel like this would have been, you don't feel like, you know, a David Bates sitting here 50 years ago would have said like, we have the exact, you know, there's a sort of push out of decision. There's, part of what's sort of fun about it. The Heidegger was like, one of those kind of critics. Yeah. Right, but but I, I mean it in the sense that, you know, there's a very Schmittian line to this or a very Schmittian sense to this. Uh, like the argument about neutralization or liberalization that he sees as, as depriving the possibility of, of decision. But you have a completely different level of fascination and, and yeah. excitement around the technological uh, in this. Oh, in that's this. a really important point, absolutely. Um, and that, that would be, again, looking, looking to Stigler, um, because we're defined as human beings, <clears throat> as technical beings, from the earliest stone tools, as you know, through to contemporary technologies, there's no possibility for this sort of Heideggerian critique, which is to say we must retreat into another form of thinking mm -hmm. that could save us. So this is what would, 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 would distinguish us from that particular moment. Mm -hmm. There's no kind of saving moment possible. But on the other hand, as Stigler says, technologies have what he, what he calls, coming from Derrida, pharmacological quality. Every technology can be disruptive, but every technology also harbors within it possibilities of stability or, or engagement um, for us to thrive with. So we can be very pessimistic about contemporary technologies, especially artificial intelligence. But at the same time, I wouldn't be like Heidegger pessimistic that this is the end of thinking. It's actually a challenge. It's a challenge to, to, to rethink where thinking will take place in a culture that's defined more by distraction and an attention economy rather than by training in the kind of methods that we take for granted in the humanities, which, which is not to say I think that that's not happening. I'm much less pessimistic, I think, than Stigler was about this possibility. Mm -hmm. Jonna, do you want to take over? Um, well, a couple different things. I mean, I think you really described uh, your answer with respect to Stiegler and sort of how you're thinking about tool and technology really helped me to understand certain things about about the book as a whole. I guess I wanted to ask you one thing about the, and we're, we, we do want to leave time for questions, so we're getting near the end of our time, but um, something about the question of the extended mind or the hive brain. One of the things I found really moving about uh, the book is the way that you describe writing is the technology as you've just described it now, but also a place where um, a space for sort of the sedimentation of all different kinds of other brains where you bring things together in this writing and just a little a little more non ritual praise. One of the things that's remarkable about the book is not just the erudition, you know, the, the astonishing range of, of sources that are that are used here, but the way that you're engaging with them, and as Stefanos was saying, the way you are making them engage with with each other. So the, there's a really creative sort of 
there's an intellectual generosity to that, I think, to allowing all of these thinkers to come together in one space. Um, and then there's also a lot of creativity in, in the writing. So I guess I wanted to ask you a question about writing, um, which could take several different forms. I was struck in the Wittgenstein chapter, the writing becomes almost aphoristic. I mean, it's like notes, basically, and you're writing about his, I can't remember what they're called in German because I don't know German. Slips but, of paper. Yeah, slips of paper. Um, and, you know, it's a remarkable, it's a very short, again, very short little piece, but it's a remarkable um, discussion. Uh, and I just, I felt that you were sort of um, in some sort of, talk about symbiosis with with Wittgenstein in that, in that particular chapter, which um, is pretty, pretty astonishing. So I guess just if you could talk a little bit about how you were thinking about writing in this book and sort of the creativity of it, the form of it. Um, well, how important first, it's that very nice you. of you to say that there's some creativity in it because I don't, <laughs> there is. especially when you look back at your own writing, you're never, you know, super pleased with all of it. But I do like your metaphor of sedimentation because that's kind of what I was aiming for at the, with the book. And there is a risk that it's a chaos, like a recipe for, for disaster, chaos, or grandiosity, which is still a, a, a risk of, of a project like this. But part of it was wanting to, to, to be kind of um, engaged with the deep sedimentation of ideas around this problem and that it wouldn't seem right to just speak to the people interested in contemporary technology or just speak to the early modernists mm -hmm. around their questions. But to try and really show that sedimentation and the way that sometimes the sediment gets, you know, um, roiled up by certain currents and especially by these apocal moments. Um, so, so thank you for that. It's kind of what I was aiming for. And the word generous too is, is one that I often use in my, my teaching is I feel like I try and teach students, especially those that are really good at critique to, to be as generous as possible with the text. And so that was the way that I wrote actually a lot of the book was to try and immerse myself as much as possible into the kind of conceptual world of these different thinkers. And some require a lot more immersion, as you know, if you try to deal with, like for me, Spinoza was really, really hard. Leibniz was really, really hard. You can read a lot about those people and it just seems like they're repeating the same problems in the text and they don't really help you. So I had a few moments of waking up in the middle of the night where it's like, okay, I think I figured out something um, to do with Leibniz. So that was, that was really what guided me is to, is to try and slip into the text as much as possible. The risk there is that you lose your own voice, but as Stefano said, I tried to keep the chapters short so that you kind of move through them without getting too bogged down um, in individual, individual sections. Um, but otherwise, I think a lot of it was improvisation and mm -hmm. partly it was due to a kind of maniacal phase during COVID when I was shut down and wrote a lot of the book kind of just by writing every single day in, in sort of a haze, so. And one of your children suggested that to you that you should write Well, at down. one point I was doing so much work, like I was really busy that I hadn't started writing. And she said, you know, it's really time that you start writing. So I do owe it to my daughter for Very kind good. of pushing me. Thank you, Heather. <laughs> was some, like, I always wondered if you went like a kind of tweezers, like the front and the back, like the, the, the sort of the early, period the early modern period and then the last text and then yeah. had like particular little bits in the middle that then you needed to fill out yeah that's a different? good that's a good way of putting it and I also cut a lot of some of the middle because I felt like the middle was less essential than these kind of like opening gestures and the closing part of the book that's so, how I read it yeah. instead of chat gpt mm -hmm. that was my solution <laughs> okay <laughs> it's just to skip the 19th century no, completely <laughs> No, but, but of course, when you try and do something like this, there's so many different paths you can take. And there's so many major figures that I still didn't tangle with, but I tried to at least have moments from each of the historical periods where, where like you say, the sedimentation of ideas um, was visible. Shall we open it out? So. Would you like to take your own question? Sure, I know it's hard to ask questions about a book that is, is just that you virtual. you haven't read yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'll have a shot. Uh, yeah, of course it's hard to, but you mentioned something uh, about that you were more optimistic than Heidegger about thinking in new technologies. Isn't there a survival bias part of that? You know, is Heidegger not going to be right in the long run where, you know, at some point we invent a technology that will kill our thinking? Destroy us? Yeah, that was true with Stigler too. I mean, his later work is very much engaged with thinking about the relationship of the technosphere to the Anthropocene and the possibility of 
total destruction of the earth. So the robots are going to get us. Well, that I think is maybe a, a bit of a fantasy sometimes. Um, so what, when I said I'm more a little more positive, I think it's to, to come out of, of Steph's question, which is that without being a solutionist or a Silicon Valley, you know, nerd or something, that it's still possible mm -hmm. to to recognize the history of the history of technology as as giving us not just solutions to sort of engineering problems, but new capacities for thought. So, so there's there's no question that the digital revolution has given us new capacities for thought. It's just that the pathological side of it is accelerating in ways that we don't necessarily know how to handle. And that's what I mean by trying to like slow things down in part is to think historically and conceptually about this development rather than take it as a determinist history that 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 AI must happen and that we must introduce it into the classroom and that it must you know, essentially take over the world. This is a decision that we make as human beings. The same with the robots, I think, that, that we're gonna have to make a decision whether we want a robotic world or not. And, and that's not, not automatic. Maybe, okay. Look at this, I'm performing the argument of the book. My intelligence is being electrified through this technology. So I have two questions. Um, one is about Rousseau, the other is about God, but I don't want to preempt God Joanna with Rousseau. Book. I'm less worried about God, but is it okay, Joanna, if I ask a few questions? Of course, questions? please. Okay. Uh, the first, I guess, the, the opening claim that there's no such thing as natural intelligence struck me as a quintessentially Rousseauian claim Absolutely. from yeah. the Second Discourse. And when you were saying that in some ways you started thinking with Rousseau, I wasn't terribly surprised, but I, I wondered then, since Rousseau didn't figure as much as you thought he might, or maybe you never thought he would in the book, if you could do a bit of that work here with us, because when I started thinking about it, you know, all of Rousseau's comments about the, the prehistory of human cognition in the second discourse always accompany a material or technological revolution. Um, but then when he gets to Let's say the collective political intelligence of du contrat social, I would say that that is itself a kind of good artificial intelligence. It answers the problem that he poses in the second discourse. Mm -hmm. But then when that experiment fails, he, by the reveries, thinks that, well, we're all doomed to become automata or something, and that, you know, leaves him very depressed. So I, I just was wondering if you could comment a bit on that sort of Rousseauian strand. And then sort of more generally, there's the God question. Um, <laughs> You know, there's been a lot of great work done recently on the ways in which the history of theology and the history of science really can't be extricated from each other in the early modern period. So I'm thinking of your colleague Jonathan Sheehan and his work with Jorah Warman on self-organization, but also Jessica Riskin uh, on sort of the history of passive and active mechanism. Um, so I wonder if you could say a bit more about that as well, because if you think of, you know, Descartes, for example, He's, he's responding to, but also contributing to a theological problem, you know, related around the possibility of intelligence. I mean, at least that's one way of reading both the project and the discourse on method and then later the meditation. So, um, so yeah, if you could say something more about where sort of the history of theology might be another thread that you could weave through this incredibly rich story. Great, thank you. Now I'm hearing it from Joanna and from you that the Rousseau probably should have been in the book. And you're you're absolutely right, is that I've been teaching the second discourse and and thinking about it for my whole career. So this is in some ways a rewriting of the second discourse through the history of thinking about technology. Um so in my defense, I would just say, I think you're absolutely right, is that that he starts with the idea of the human as lack, as lacking instinct, lacking a kind of natural capacity and that never really acquires true intelligence until there's a kind of moment of, of uh, revolution that changes the conditions enough that there's a, a kind of possibility of intelligence and the advance of society. So I think that, that Rousseau could easily have been in the, in the book. Um, the, the, just in my defense, quickly, I would say I did a little, like quite a bit with Rousseau in my last book, and I didn't really wanna repeat some of those arguments that, that cross over. And I also figure that this argument has been made about technology and about the openness of the human, really by Derrida partly already, but definitely by Stigler and Techniques and Time from 1994. 
there's a whole long reading of Rousseau on this question. Um, so that's 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 my mea culpa, though. I should have been more direct about that, probably. It's it's weird that the 18th century was probably like the least mm. part of the book, um, having spent a lot of time in the 18th century. So the God question. Uh, I just, I'm super interested in God. Um, <laughs> and and this idea of political theology in particular, and and your idea of economic theology, this is like super interested in that. So I just didn't feel like it was part of the trajectory that I was excavating, which is not to say it's not important. Like it does come in a little bit with Descartes, definitely with Spinoza and Leibniz, there has to be some acknowledgement of that and Spinoza chapter for sure. But I, I think there's a way, in fact, that you could read Descartes, I don't know if you'd agree to go this far, but you could kind of read him as not an anti-theological thinker, but as sort of playing with the theological discourse. I'm not sure how committed he really was to it, but but I, I really wanted to show in the book how you could extricate these ideas around selfhood, intellect, the body, machinery, um, even though Descartes does talk about God as a kind of engineer making these animals that we see in the world, I felt like these were kind of just structural concepts rather than ones that were essential to the, the trajectory. So I really did kind of bracket the theological from most of the book. And I'll just have to wait and see if, if people go with me on this or not. Um, I'm not sure what's what's missing, given that often the discourses of technology and theology don't don't match on to one another as as easily. Uh, I don't know what you might think about that. Uh, whether whether there's some things that might be obvious candidates for that. I mean, Babbage might be one of them actually. Yeah, thank you. I mean, the the Rousseau question is a, a really good one. Yeah. I think she. Oh, sorry, sorry. I think I still the send it to you. Okay. <laughs> I actually wanted to ask, I mean, in a way, this somewhat follows up on the Rousseau question. It is somewhat related to it. Um, insofar as I want to think about the relationship between nature and history um, and nature and the human in your works. I mean, what I'm struck by is that in your title, you're still calling it natural intelligence, right? So, I mean, as was discussed, you know, you're performing this disruption of the idea of artificial intelligence in your title, right? But you're also disrupting the idea of natural history. Um, so, you know, I mean, in listening to you, I've, you know, really curious to hear, I mean, I also read the blurb of your book on my phone and, you know, you're talking about trying to create a non-natural origin um, for the reproduction of the, the production of the human being, right? I think I'm quoting that right. Um, and, you know, and you, when you were discussing, um, well, the early history of humanity, we are talking about humans and fire and so forth, and you were trying to talk about how technology, um, is what makes humans exceptional, right? It's what takes makes humans exceptional in relationship to animals is what you were saying. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I want would, was hoping you might talk about, but I mean, maybe specifically through answering the question of why it is that you're calling it natural intelligence in the title of your book, like in what sense do you mean that? Well, it's still a, a threshold concept because um, especially thinking about the origin of harmonization and what we mean by humans as being an exception to nature in that they take themselves out of natural biological evolutionary constraints and construct a cultural, technical, political, social environment that evolves in a different way with different logic and a different time scale. Um, nonetheless, we are biological creatures. So I did want to play on the fact that at the origin of harmonization, we would say that a human being is still a natural object that seems to be invaded by an unnatural object, literally the technical implement. So what, what it means for a human being to be naturally intelligent is to be artificially invaded, you might say, by, by, the, by the instrument that is technology. So if you wanted to say, well, that means that it's artificial intelligence, first of all, there's a confusion because we think of artificial intelligence as being a simulation of human natural intelligence. But I also think it's not quite right because it's not purely artificial it's still naturalized and that it inhabits a living brain and a living body. So I'm, I'm interested in it as a kind of threshold concept. So to explain it more in the title would have been really difficult, I think. But I thought that by saying it's an artificial history rather than a natural, there's books like The Natural History of Intelligence by like uh, Tomasello and mm -hmm. others in cognitive science have variations on the theme of 
natural history of intelligence, natural history of the brain, and so on. Um, so I thought by by using this term artificial history, it's to say we have to track the engagement of artifice and nature in what we mean by natural intelligence. If we say that human beings are intelligent, it is by our nature, but getting back to Rousseau, our nature is a weird one. It lacks, it's fundamentally a nature that lacks something. So I wouldn't want to get rid of the concept of the natural, but but put it into play with the evolution of the, the artificial as something essential to that, that covering of that gap or that lack. Find the concept of intelligence so useful? It's very problematic, intelligence. I mean, that's why it's shied away from thinking about IQ and all of those kinds of questions. Yeah. Fanny, just just so you don't, we had somebody right here just so, for after so you don't forget. Can you give three examples? Okay, sure. Um, you mentioned Heidegger and his view of the end of reason. Um, as history progresses and as more technology advances. And then I think I remember you being in agreement with some critical theorists in saying that humans are objectified as we reproduce in society. But then I think you diverged in that sort of line of thinking by saying that there is no end of reason and that there is probably going to be a development of a new way to think. So I was curious as to, you know, if you could just explain more about that and why the divergence. Yeah, that's a good question. Or did you want to take two in, in a row or? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, try and, I'll try and be brief with, with the answer because those are really, really important concepts. Just, just quickly with Heidegger, I mean, what he really was arguing, especially in question concerning technology was, that life itself had become um, enframed as, as a kind of system of, of instrumentalization and that humans themselves have now become part of chains and, and networks of instrumental uh, exchanges. And that had reduced the capacity to think to almost a minimum. And as he said in later work, cybernetics was the end of philosophy. Although he still harbored some belief that the mind could have access to truth if there was a you know, proper clearing, but where that was going to take place was very un unclear, um, to put it that way. Uh, with someone like Stigler, he's interested in upping the ante of Heidegger by saying it's not just instrumentalization anymore, it's also automatization, and that we're being inducted and, and, and sort of trained within systems that are not just of instrumentality, but also of automatization, which is even worse and worse for thinking. But unlike Heidegger, Stigler, and myself, I think we, we would agree that there's this pharmacological property. In other words, the technology can be a poison, and it really is a poison, especially when you look at some of the work being done on screen use by you know, very young children and so on. Um, but it can also be this possible remedy, which is to say, opening up, enabling new ways of, of thinking. And, and, and that's something that Heidegger didn't believe because he thought thinking was something that was resolutely opposite to, to technology itself. He wanted to go back to poesis and the bringing forth that idea that was completely erased in modern society. So, so that's the way I would kind of um, put those two into relationship. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the talk and Looking forward to reading the book. Um, I have a question that I understand will be, I will find the answer probably in the book, but just maybe you could give it a little bit of taste. So what's like in the current uh, steps of development of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, generative AI, what is, uh, you mentioned the coherency of our world, how we as human are operating. What is uh, the thing that is lacking uh, the big, the big uh, gap between what has been achieved so far by the research in artificial intelligence and the coherent picture of the world or a coherent picture of how the human operates. What's lacking in the modern research of AI? Well, I think one thing is we can say, is it really artificial intelligence? Intelligence is a complicated question, but I think 
what we're really looking at with contemporary machine learning is artificial stupidity rather than artificial intelligence. Because what all of these programs and, and algorithms and systems are, are designed to do is to, is to extract the, the norms of data sets and to, to be as normal as possible, especially with large language models. They're looking at, you know, trillions of, of, of words and, and vectorizing them in all sorts of different ways, but to generate the, the least interesting and the most normal response possible. And that's, I think, something that's gone through thinking around machine learning from, from the 80s on. So what's lacking there is a complete and utter um, erasure of this idea of systematic uh, in, incoherence or disautomatization or the exceptional or things that are not actually produced from the normal. When we think of machine learning as predicting or generating, it's generating based on its own history and it's generating something that is the most normal possible response that it can produce. But we think of humans as, like in Heidegger's sense, anticipating a future. It's to anticipate something that we haven't actually yet achieved. It's something open. It's something, it's something that is to come, but is not necessarily reducible to what has already happened. So I would say that the, the, the bulk of work in artificial intelligence today is really artificial stupidity, and it does that really, really well. But it, but it, but the the history that I show is is one that says that there's ways of thinking in the past where computer scientists and cognitive scientists and others have actually taken this question seriously of error, disruption, interruption, novelty, and so on. But thank you. Thank you, and you partially answered my question as well. Uh, it is a very naive one, but you mentioned the crisis of decision making, uh, and it sounds like you can outsource and ask for somebody who knows better, and that knowing better is, is especially asking um, an average person, right? Um, there is also an overload of things that you're supposed to do and optimization of everything toward a certain norm, normal. Exactly, yeah. Right, mm -hmm. which is a huge problem with kids' education, right? Uh, so, so a certain degree of normalization is is necessary in order for us to like behave civilly with one another, and to have certain expectations of 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 you know like in scientific work and so on. Certain normativity is essential to knowledge, but not an excessive um, reduce of, you know reduction of everything to optimization. And that's I think what you're pointing to is is a danger in contemporary society. There's there's a book that I quote in in the introduction. Um, that said that the title is Algorithms to Live By. And it's really like a, a horrifying title so to try and say that we should live our lives according to the kind of clarity of and 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 optimizable optimizability of algorithms. So right. So my question was, did you mean it in a similar to military terms where uh, where too much intelligence basically gives you a false sense of knowing things? Where, where that just can you elaborate on the crisis of decision making? Uh, oh well, I would think like the excessive emphasis on normalization, optimization, and with machine learning models is is a complete absence of what I would call decision, which is a recognition of something that defies the norms, something that is abnormal. In in a machine learning system, the abnormal is always just digested by the system as an error. It just gets back propagated, and then there's another prediction. But, but to, to actually stop, like Descartes talks about this in Passions of the Soul, he, he talks about the, the capacity for wonder, where you're arrested and stopped at something that defies explanation. And that's when true decision takes place, is when there's a recognition that the norms are failing. Now, there's a political mm -hmm. valence to this as well. Um, but when the norms fail, we have to anticipate a future that is not given. And what machine learning systems do, and large language models are just machine learning systems, is produce normative predictions based on what's already happened. They're not capable of self-interruption. They're not capable of recognizing crisis. And they're definitely not capable of anticipating a future that has not been seen before. Especially when you think of like creative diffusion models and so on, they're the opposite of creativity, really, uh, in a lot of ways. Finally, sorry, you were like, oh, on no, your hand this off. is great. All, all the other questions were great. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm here representing the solutionists and the Silicon Valley nerds. Um, but uh, what really resonated with me is you're talking about kind of the diminishing of the human capacity for a decision. 
uh, which seems to be an effect of the current technological landscape. Um, this is an effect I've observed a lot, um, been building AI products for almost a decade. Mm -hmm. um, the problem I see is that there's like, uh, there's systemic reasons for this, right? There are trillion dollar, trillions of dollars to be made by just building bigger, more better, more predictive AI systems. Absolutely. Um, and so that's like one vision of the world. You, you said it was a societal decision that we make to build these systems, but, but being, it doesn't feel like a decision to anyone. No, it's being made by capital. It's not precisely. being made by actual political um, individuals, yeah. And then there's like an increasingly dominant alternative or uh, kind of, mm, reactionary narrative which is like oh this stuff is dangerous we need to shut it down um which i think is plausible but no one's really articulating how we get to technology that helps augment this like innate human capacity for decision um Perfect. so i'm yeah. curious if you can speak to that. that that's a really important point is is one of the goals of the book is to say there is no such thing as artificial intelligence because intelligence is always already technical so to invent an AI would be to invent a, an artificially intelligent system that could somehow create technology itself. Like it, it, the, the metaphors start to slip around. But if we take seriously this idea that our technical implements are not just like tools, but, but actually thinking capacities, then that's the, the future of artificial intelligence is how can these models and how can these systems augment what is already important about human intelligence, which is this capacity for, let's call it self-interruption for, for, for decision, what we could call in older terms, the will. Uh, I, I agree with you completely. What we need is a more philosophical AI, but that's, that's right at the, the center of this question of the pharmacological character of technology. It can either be like this dangerous or, or just a, an instrument of capital that will destroy people's lives in certain ways, or it could be something else. It could enable ways of thinking that, that we haven't even imagined yet. So I'm on board. It's just how do we invest against the logic of capital in artificial intelligence? Right, what you have instead is this, like you say, a dichotomy of outright uh, solutionist fervor, or they're going to take over the world and maybe even kill us. The, there's another path, which is massive investment in the technology from a public perspective. That might sound too socialist, but it's like, it's a possibility. It's a possibility. Um, as a quick follow-up, so that's the lever. I was going to ask about the levers you see to enable that kind of middle path. And you see that as public investment in it's uh, just one. public I mean, education it, version of. Yeah, it would be rethinking education and re rethinking investment in these technologies. As 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 so someone else was mentioning, I mean, they're they're essentially run by capital now. They're not run in any kind of rational sense of the word. So the big technology companies have, have taken over the world in like two decades. It, it's really astonishing. And there's very little regulation about what they do. That doesn't mean that we should be clamping down on them in a sort of micromanaging, but, but there's ways that we have to think about how these technologies are transforming the planet. And that doesn't mean that it has to be run by the logic of capital. It's just not necessary. But that requires a decision and we're getting less and less interested in making decisions, it seems. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, this question is obviously probably not in the book, but I, I, I'm just curious about what your thoughts on it. Um, there's become an increased interest in hacking the autonomic system of the body. Um, so those automatic systems in the body um, that we normally do not control. Um, Obviously, there's been a long history yeah. of this in in, in in Tibetan culture in particular. Um, but I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on the, at this moment in which you know we're becoming more automatic machines in a certain way. What do you how do you interpret this desire to go into those automatic processes in the bodies and show that you can actually have you some play with them? Control over yeah. Them? So can I clarify? This is like cold water swimming yoga is that what we're that's, talking about that's one, that's, that's one version real action that's, that's real a action. super question i mean that's that's a really interesting question and i don't discuss cold water bathing at all in the in the book but the way i would answer your question or like it seems like a possible answer is a way that that is in in some ways trying to think of the body as a new form of technology was to, to reorganize the the already organized or to inter interrupt and to intercept 
certain kinds of automatic processes to lead you in a different direction. So I think that that, that would be very much in line with this kind of Stiglerian approach, which is there's no reason why a reorganization of the body can't be understood as part of the history of technology. And it's probably been a long history and definitely not just a Western one, which I will admit in the book, I, I confess is a Western trajectory. But I think the more, as I say in the introduction, the more lines of thought that interconnect, the, the richer this sort of um, history would be. So yeah, that, that would be my answer. I don't know how you feel about that. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you. Um, thank you, David. Congratulations. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank thanks. you, Stefano. Thanks.